Hey, what is up, everyone? It's Rich. All right, welcome to Rich and Kelsey Live. <laughs> Kelsey, where are you? He's somewhere. I don't know. I haven't talked to him all week. So, anyway, I had mentioned on Super Fun Sunday that uh, I was going to be taking a break from YouTube um, only to uh, finish my obligations that I have right now. So, um, working on Crystal Planet has been very time consuming and uh, it's a lot of work, you know, honestly. So, um, I want to finish that up. I've got probably. I have nine pages left to go, but three of them are penciled. Everything is laid out. And uh, let me know. Can you guys hear me okay? Andro, Andro, Taz, and Michael. I'm not sure how many people we have here. It looks like two are watching. This is a huge turnout. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I thought what, what I would do is is uh, go over one of my favorite artists, which is Mike Mignola. I love Mike's work. It is the best. The best of the best. Um I have heard about Mignola's Lockdown Sketchbook. Uh, I think it might be up for order right now. So I'm not 100% sure. It does sound live. Oh, okay. Live chat is, it's funny. StreamYard isn't updating my live chat, but the chat is going on. Um, the chat is, oh, okay. Now here it goes. Hey, the chat wasn't loading on StreamYard, so I wasn't seeing anyone's replies. What's up, Kareem? Passing by. Welcome. Are you a fan of Mignola? If you are, you came to the right place. If not, I'm going to uh, fix my hat. Uh, hey, what is up, Christopher, Billy, Orpheus? Um, we've got Voss J and Michael. So, yeah, this will be fun. Um, look, if Kelsey pops up in the chat, I'll throw his ass in the stream. But I don't know. He's keeping a low profile. <laughs> so pre-order that book. Oh, did you? Nice. I'm like... Um, I'm trying not to buy books right now. I'm a fan of friend. I am too, <laughs> dude. So anyway, like I, I was, I get actually slightly nervous doing the live streams alone just because it's, it is a lot to manage and, um, it's not so much, um, being live is, is, uh, you know what I mean? You just don't want to mess up or do, um, do a bad stream where it's boring, but uh, I did want to give updates. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes, like we always do at the beginning of the video and hopefully give you guys some inspirational and uh, insightful looks into um, going from being an inker to a penciler, or you could just pretend that uh, going from not drawing comic books to drawing comics, because it is a big difference. I've, I've been trying to stress this to people all along my career, what I've done is I've tried to reach out to people in the best way possible, which is generally, hey, what is up, everyone? Thank you guys for popping in. Um, is literally since I've been online, I've always gone to fan groups and I've tried to hang out there more, not for any sort of um, professional reasons, other than the fact that uh, I do actually enjoy trying to help people, um, you know, figure out what they're up to. It's just my nature. <laughs> I've shared this story before. Hey, what is up, Lake Kick? This is a funny story. I'll tell this one quick. So I remember being in, I think, first or second grade, and I actually got to school early, and me and this other kid that I knew, not a best friend by any means, but just a, another kid in my class that I, that I did like, and he hadn't done his math homework. And um, I'll tell you in a second what artist editions I have. And um, I did this kid's math homework, before class and and went into class and didn't have my done mine done so i got an f for my homework and i actually did someone else's homework that's the kind of person i am that's encoded in me i can't escape it even if i would like to <laughs> so artist editions that i have um and look I'll, I'll be honest with you just so that you don't think like uh oh, fuck this guy he's got all these artist editions he's like loaded with money generally speaking i can only afford one or two a year so although i do have a decent collection uh it took me you know i don't even know eight to ten years to get them all um so right now in my office i have the bernie wrights in one which is excellent i have um the kelly jones batman one which is really good. Honestly, I think that's one of the best ones I have. Um, I have both of the Hellboy ones. So I have um, Hellboy Goes to Hell. And then the other one is, I think, called... Um, it's the Curious... Uh, is it? Oh, Amazing Screw on Head and the Curious uh, Objects. I have... Um, the Bill Sienkiewicz one, which is is actually very, very cool. I was just 
Bill is such a mad scientist with his art. I thought that it would be interesting to see his work full size, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, I have both of the Spawn books, so one and two. Those are excellent. I, you know, everyone knows that Spawn is kind of what got me into comics. And although, um, you know, I think I've grown a lot as an artist and a fan, um, I still really, really enjoy Todd McFarlane's art. Nobody really kind of you know, Todd is Todd. He's just got a lot of energy and um, it's fun stuff. Um, I have um, the Michael Turner Superman, Superman Batman book. So that's an interesting one for me and I'll explain why. And this isn't a slight against Mike because obviously he's deceased. I never really followed Michael Turner's art. I always thought that he was good, but it wasn't something that I was really like super into. But on YouTube, I saw someone do a review of the Michael Turner Batman Superman book and it was excellent. It, it's really cool. He kind of draws characters in a very stylish way like they're very lanky and sometimes that they can look a little stiff um but but it was so good so it's a great great artist edition i would highly recommend and especially if you're a fan of michael turner you need to get it because it is really good and it's all shot from pencil it's it's incredible what that guy did he's so good um the other one that i have in here right now is i have sam keith batman that's the most recent one that i got and i got that probably about a year back it's pretty good um but uh i don't know i if i was gonna get a sam keith book like in a fantasy world i would go for um like his marvel comics presents era stuff but the the batman stuff is nice i do have a few others that aren't in the house right now i have the, oh i have the kirby ones i have ronin I have um, Sin City. Uh, I have The Dark Knight Returns. I have two. No, I have one Jack Kirby one. I think I have the one that's the Jack Kirby World's Greatest Artist one. I have a Walter Simonson one. But again, I mean, it sounds like I have a ton. Do Tim Bradstreet? I would do Tim. Uh, I'm actually a good friend of Tim's. If Tim was more internet-y, I would try to get him on, but I think it would be nearly impossible to get him to do a live stream, but who knows? Maybe he would. Tim is a great guy though, and a very, very talented artist. But yeah, so it sounds like I have a lot of them and I do, um, but uh, again, you know, I'm getting maybe two a year and I haven't bought one in a while. In fact, in the last like two or three years, I think besides the McFarlane ones, um, you know, the McFarlane ones, when you get them new are not that expensive. They're like 80, 80, 80 bucks. Yeah, we'll um we'll get into drawing stuff. So in a second, so I'll I'll talk about now um, getting into penciling and things that you can anticipate if you're interested in in drawing comics, specifically sequentials. Because I think um, I talked to someone today. Well, there's two different people. One was on Twitter, and then one was on Instagram. Generally speaking, you should follow me on both and even Facebook. Although I rarely post on Facebook but I try not to duplicate my posts. So what I post on Twitter in a day will generally not be what I post on Instagram. So I mix it up and, uh, um, but uh, I've been trying to give people sort of advice as I'm learning it on drawing comic books. And again, I'm talking about sequential comic books from a script, whether that's something that you wrote yourself or something that you were collaborating with. Um, um, this is the advice that I've been giving people is I think personally, if you really want to draw comic book stories, you should just start drawing stories is it doesn't matter what level of skill you're at. I think that that will get you headed the right direction faster than anything else. You'll have to learn stuff along the way, but this idea that you're going to prepare to draw comic books, I think is a fallacy <laughs> telling you the honest God truth. Uh, you can practice literally forever. And I'm telling you, when you start, especially if you're working from someone else's script, so this is the difference between Blaster Kid and Crystal Planet for me. Crystal Planet is, someone else wrote the script. It's 150 pages of storytelling that I need to do. And it's about a 230 page script. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff in that book that I would generally not draw, just, just on the sheer quantity of it alone. So this idea of like, well, if I learn to do flying poses and I can draw faces pretty good and I can draw hands, it's like, it's not what it is. You, the whole thing needs to sort of homogenize. 
I think the idea of influences is also something that goes out the window really fast. Like, look, I, I, I can't even imagine. I know, I know that there's people that cobble their style together this way. Like when I read a page of script and I need to lay it out, the last thing that I'm going to do is go through 50 comic books trying to find <laughs> some drawing that another artist did to figure out what I need to do. I need to be able to make it up and draw it. If I can't do that, I'm not drawing comics. So what I ultimately ended up doing with this Crystal Planet story in particular was, um, you know, I read it and I, I kind of came up with an idea of what I thought sort of the look of the book would be. And and I actually saw Joe Satriani tweeted yesterday talking about um, Saturday morning cartoons. That's the test. Yeah, drawing from a script is difficult. Um, and uh, so was interesting is when I read the script, I didn't really have any artistic direction. They had kind of seen my work on a few different things I had done that I had drawn on my own. And um, they knew that I could handle some stuff. But uh, so my original idea, and this, uh, it sounds weird when I say it, because it doesn't completely make sense, especially when you see what I ended up doing. But um, hey, what's up, Israel? Wow, that's incredible. Good, good evening to you. Um, but uh, I, I have this idea of that, like, if I could do something that had the level of detail and kind of charm of, of a really good Jack Kirby comic, I think what it is, too, is because Joe Satriani years ago used a um, Silver Surfer piece um, for the cover of Surfing with the Alien. So in my mind, I kind of picture this more cartoony sort of look and, the, the you know, it made me think of people like Jack Kirby and John Buscema, but I don't draw like either one of those two artists. So I pulled I pulled my my ideas that direction and kind of went like try to do try to do it in this sort of look that that would be less um <laughs> like blaster kid is very dark and it's it's more stuff that i would probably naturally do but i i i think that, that doing both at the same time will really um be a good thing but yeah so the style on the style on the crystal planet stuff is much more clean there's not a lot of rendering right now i'm basically what's up from london too man you guys live in some amazing places it reminds me of when i like occasionally i'll, I'll um Right, you, it is possible. Don't don't uh, brain. You could be on to something. <laughs> I told them. I go. I go. If if you guys do a buckethead book, I want to do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, what was I going to say? Oh, um, but but yeah. So so um, it's been really interesting. But yeah, I mean, my advice would be if you want to draw stories, just start drawing stories and then learn along the way. The things that you're bad at, you're going to start to gravitate to. Like if you if you see that, like you're like man, I don't really know how to draw jackets well, then you can kind of deal with it at that moment. You know what I mean? And you're, 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 you're seeking out information based on information, which is that you have a lack of it. Like, cause the thing is, is then I tell artists this, that are trying to learn, um, uh, you don't really know what you're naturally good at until you actually test yourself with, with more. Well, I mean, I'm drawing this thing with no reference. It's funny because as they've been showing more of the promo art, people keep um, the costume design for the main characters. You know, they'll, they'll post like, I, it was some weird robot movie or something that sort of looked a little bit like the costume. And then there was um, some uh, like two, the two DJs that wear the helmets um, had wore a costume that was sort of similar. I didn't use any reference for the costume. I just made it up. I mean, it's definitely in my mind based on something from Tron. Um, but past that, I didn't, I never cross-referenced it with anything. So it just happened. But, but um, to, to do, to sit down and make up all that stuff, tells you what you're good at and what you're not. And you may surprise yourself because there could be things that um, pop up. Yeah, Daft Punk, right? So there was a costume that they wore somewhere at one point that like sort of vaguely looks like it because it's like lit with blue. So it's not a big deal, but uh, I figure I'll be honest with people and tell people exactly how I did do it, which is, you know, we sent the colorist reference, but the way that I made this stuff up was literally I just sat and pounded through about two and a half weeks worth of drawing shit until I figured out stuff that I liked. And then there was um, some additions that Lexi, who is he's he's considered the editor on the book. I just consider him sort of like a partner um, when I work on stuff. He's he's been really awesome. And he was the one that hooked me up with the job. <clears throat> so anyway, 
but blaster kid to me is like blaster kids like a playground it's all the things that i'm i'm i love to do the things that i would naturally create and um you know it just they're very different so when you see the crystal planet stuff if you're like hmm, this isn't really what i was picturing for blaster kid they, they they're not going to look anything alike to be honest it's very different so all right we're going to look at mike mignola today Kier, what is up new world creative hello brain games michael hing leg kick i think i got everyone above kick cassis uh and alonicus and uh look mike mignola is one of my favorite favorite artists in fact i would actually say that in terms of comic books he probably is my favorite comic book artist i i say frank miller in that small group like if i had a top three it would be frank miller mignola and travis um but i kind of think mignola edges them all out right yeah and blaster kid i mean i definitely i mean one influence i could definitely say that i have in it is um like Jay Lee, it's not so much that I'm like referencing Jay Lee or anything like that, but but the look that he had like on Namor to me, I think is really cool, and so that's something that I've I've wanted to carry over into um, you know something for my whole career. So that's going to be the opportunity to do it. So um, Wow, okay, so you were introduced to Mignola when he took over for Alpha Flight. I like those Alpha Flight covers actually quite a bit. His, um, Mignola did all those really great Marvel Comics Presents covers. Is that, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Marvel Comics Present. I collected all of those. They're really, really cool. Yeah, oh, and Billy, no, no problem. I appreciate the compliments. Look, it's very, very difficult to work on two projects as once. As, as someone coming from being an inker and trying to promote my own stuff, it always is very delicate where you're really excited about what you're working on, but you have to be respectful with the collaborative projects that you're working on and not undersell one and oversell one or whatever. But I'm excited about both. To me, Crystal Planet is like my opportunity to draw a superhero book that I never thought that I would draw. So... I'm kind of approaching it like if if um, I could, you know, if I had the opportunity to do it, like this is the book that I could sort of flex those sci-fi superhero muscles on. But it's a learning process, man. I'll tell you what, um, it's 150 pages. I'm like 20 pages into it. By the time I get done with it, it'll 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 have taught me a lot. So all right. Um, always wondering what a cyberpunk Mignola would look like. So it's funny that you said that, Michael, because I didn't, I, I was, I wanted to avoid saying this directly, but, but there's a part of me because my whole time that I've been collecting comic books, Mike has really only worked on one thing, which is Hellboy. <laughs> and although he's done covers for other books, some are really, really amazing. I love the Baltimore covers that he's done. I, I really, really wish that he would do something else. I would love to see him do that that um, astronaut character that he'd been kind of drawing lately. Like, I would love to see um, uh, him do a, a comic book on that. Just something something non-Hellboy. And I love Hellboy, but I want to see him do something new. <laughs> so that's the fan in me talking. I respect his decision to stick with Hellboy, but yeah. So, all right, let's, um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to keep an eye on my iPad and, uh, people always say like get multiple screens. I have, I have a computer behind me. You see that one up there. I also have, um, I'm on a Cintiq right now, but, uh, I have other monitors. I just don't have the space for two side by side. So I'm moving my coffee and let's do this. All right. My mech shit is fucking rad top tier stuff cool well and it's gonna get better this is the funny thing i said this in um a reply on a youtube comment was i've used all of my ideas on crystal planet so anything that i designed for blaster kid i literally am gonna have to like research things and just come up with a whole new language for it because it's like like i was saying like how you kind of like you'll instinctively have stuff that you're good at or or an amount of information like you have you have so much like ingredients in your head like right now and the more you do it you gather more ingredients so someone like um david finch he's got more ingredients in his head from experiences and things that he's had to draw and stuff like that so it's like crystal planet to me was literally like me expelling like just about every single design idea that i had sort of accumulated 
Um, and so for Blaster Kid, it's actually kind of cool because, I mean, I have to come up with, like, different guns, different looking bad guys. Um, and some of the stuff I already had sort of early, you know, versions of and stuff like that. But it's 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 fun because it's going to push me to actually, um, it's like forcibly making me grow. <laughs> so, all right, let's get in the share screen. And I'm going to go to an app, application window. And I've got... Photoshop open. All right, let's enjoy some Mignola and have a fun Wednesday. All right. So now I'm going to have to follow the chat on my iPad. So here we go. What is up, Pete? Nice to see you here. All right. So I'm just going to go full screen mode. There's no rhyme, reason, or order for these covers. And in fact, I'm not going to try to name them if I don't know what exactly it's for. We're just going to look at the art and kind of enjoy what we've got going on here. So this is a cover that he did. I'm assuming it's, it's interesting too, is as he's minimalized his work more and more, he actually ultimately minimalized his signature. And it's like, now all he has is a, uh, an M. <laughs> He's like, I don't even need more letters. M is plenty. <laughs> Sorry, my camera was falling as I was doing the, the thing. I really actually like this this kind of caveman slave looking guy. He's got like a cool piece of uh, tech, you know, like a like a binding thing around his neck. And it's very, very cool. Oh, and this is cool too. So I can kind of point out some of, of I, I consider them language rules that Mike uses. For him, it's just instinctually at this point how he handles things. But I've done enough lessons for people that are fans of Mignola to be able to explain it. It's kind of like the story of him going into uh, Disney when they were working on Atlantis. And this is actually funny that it's an underwater piece that we're switching to. But he said that they had all these chalkboards with like the formulas for Mike's work. And Mike thought it was funny and it caught, caught his attention because he never thought of it that way. But if you, like for me as an outsider, if I have to explain Mignola's work to someone who's a big fan of it, I have to sort of look for um, things that he does. And so what I, what I explain to the people that want to learn about Mike's stuff is, is that depending on the size of the character or object that he's drawing, you'll see levels of detail shift and specifically with eyes. So there's a, there's a size of head that Mike draws that the eyes will start to turn into different things than what he does close up. But you can take that same idea to your own art, no matter how detailed or realistic you want to draw. In particular, if you're drawing sequential pages, because you're going to be called on to draw things that are very tiny, you know, a, could be a long shot where you're very, very far away from a scene, but you've got a lot of characters and you're going to need to allocate the level of detail and how much you're going to show. Uh, sometimes I just do little silhouettes of characters, like white silhouettes, I call them, but uh, they're outlines, you know. I like the way that that looks, and it's probably stems from Mignola. I don't know where I got it from, honestly, um, but uh, I will use those. This is a very bitmappy file, so we're not going to look at this long, but this is a Frankenstein piece that he did. Um, but... Um, yeah, so here's a sequential page. It's a little low res, but no pupils in the eyes, but these are all monsters too. So maybe Mike's monster rule is monsters look creepier without pupils. Most monsters. So it's, it's something you can kind of pay attention to. When does Mike choose to render out of a black with little feathery lines? When does he not? Again, that's something that you can kind of put into um, your own work too. Thank you, BBT. I appreciate the nice words. And um, he did X-Force yeah, number eight. That is a really, really good comic book. I have it. I love it. Um, and it's very, very cool. I'm just catching up with the chat. Just let me look here for a second. You never have to do the squint test to see if Mignola stuff reads properly. Right, right. It's always very, very nicely designed. And um, uh, just, you know, it reads well. I'm just kind of taking this in. He, what's what's great about Mike too is is he's done. Oh, this is really neat. Um, the colors are beautiful too. Uh, you know, Mike will do sort of like sketch of the days. He's been doing them a lot more on Instagram. I actually, I really appreciate that Mike sort of embraced social media and the idea of um, 
like daily posts and stuff like that. I, I find it enjoyable to see new drawings from Mike on a daily basis as a fan. That's neat to me. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff that it's funny is even his sketches are influential. I definitely saw fan art after the last few months that I know for a fact was inspired by the stuff that Mike was doing, like his Count Chocula drawings and stuff like that. They were just fun, you know, fun stuff, creative, something that you wouldn't expect to see him draw. And uh, they were cool looking, you know, really, really nice, like little, just little slices of, uh, you know, a, a few moments in Mike's life. That's cool. Yeah, this is nice. Well, it's interesting, too. I mean, he used... Oh, okay, because of the... Um, sorry, I'm going to switch tools. Um, he left that open because of the cover. That's that's interesting. Boy, he really uh, he really blocked it up. Normally, if when I'm working on covers or even inking other people's covers, you may not put stuff that's very interesting up here, but generally speaking, most people will actually do like art up here. So it's interesting that he ended it right there. He must have known exactly what he needed. Um, I'm telling you, the dude's no nonsense. This stuff is all very cool. I was commissioned to do an illustration of the Zula Vampire Queen character he didn't sketch. It's very cool, man. If you want to post a link to it, by all means, do. If you have it finished or if you want to share, you guys are more than welcome to share links in the chat. I have no problem with that. As long as everybody's cool with each other, I, I never, ever have a problem with people trying to promote their work. Um, you know, so if, if you want to share a link or if you've got a book that you're working on, by all means, uh, don't feel... Uh, you know, don't overdo it, but but by all means, please feel free to share. So, okay, so here's a page with actually a human character. So at this size, which I would consider the one to two inch drawing size, this guy's got pupils. But do you see as he pulls the camera further back that he doesn't feel the need to, where's my, uh, I have a stylus right here. He didn't feel the need to, um, to wipe this part out, you know what I mean? Like, like in this size drawing, he didn't go, well, I wanna have the whites of his eyes showing. So is that a big observation or revelation? No, but for someone learning, this is the start, this this is the beginning of the stuff that you want to focus in on. And the thing is, is the nice thing about Mike is because Mike's stuff is so sort of boiled down, you can maybe get your sort of foundational um, observation skills sort of sharpened on something like that. I talked about this before to, to some of the people in my Patreon and stuff like that about like, like if you can't pick three folds, let me, I'm going to get out of full screen mode for just one second. I'm going to switch this to a brush instead of a pencil tool. And I'm also going to grab a uh, red instead. But, but the, the idea of, look, if, if you're trying to learn something complicated and you can't indicate it with like, Oh, I'm sorry. What's going on? Oh, it's a grayscale file. I bet that's why. Is it? No? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, if you can't indicate it with a couple of lines, the odds of you being able to work it out with more detail are very, very unlikely. Like, like I said, if you can't pick a couple of simple folds that might be appealing on a figure, the odds of you being able to work out a bunch are, are highly, highly unlikely. So someone like Mike or another artist that you like that, that boils their stuff down to this extent might be something that's helpful for you. Again, he's got this smaller head and now all of a sudden the eyes are just shapes. So that might be a takeaway for you is when you draw heads that are about this size that you're not going to do pupils. Now on this one, he decided to light up the eye and he's got this side of the face quite black. So, um, you know, he did more. But again, this is all instinctual stuff from Mike at this point. He just trusts his eye because that's what I'm doing is is I don't even think about it anymore. If I draw a head a certain size, it's like I just start to remove detail from it. As you zoom in, you kind of tend to ramp up the detail a bit, you know. Um, Mike's hands are very, very direct. I think they're very distinct. There's definitely been, there's a few artists. Mike, or Ryan Souk was one, and I think Matt Matt Smith, was that his name? Those two guys were very, very Mignola influenced. I'm going to catch up with the chat really quick. 
Um, I'd like to see a high-level colorist painter try to make the style look three-dimensional. I think the result would look red. Well, look, when Mike when Mike does the watercolor paintings over his work, I think they're beautiful. It's some of my favorite stuff that he does. Um, so we've got a battle. The scene reminds me of Battle Angel Alita. Um, I don't know of her having an influence on Manuel, but has anyone noticed similar his work in Otto Dix or Kathy Colwitz? I went to a Mignola lecture years ago, and he said Jack Kirby is a huge influence. Yeah, for sure. I know that with Mike. I know for years and years, everybody would always go, oh, he's really into Toth. And Mike has dispelled that myth multiple times. Um, I don't. I know Otto Dix. Um, I don't know Kathy Kolwitz's work. Um, but I'll Google him and see. This is cool. This is trippy, honestly. I've seen it before. It's been a while. I, I remember the color version more than the black and white. But um, the spawn head kind of lost the form for me. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't feel very three dimensional. It's funny too. Is is these are nice and three dimensional, like these skulls on the face. But he didn't really get much form on Spawn's head because even though the mask, I just don't feel any planes like like a. Uh, so it feels like his face really flattened out for me. But uh, it's a very, very cool shot. I, I love the angle that he chose. And this is fine, too. Pay pay attention to this. Oh, well. So this is part of the architecture. So it's it's got this area that points out. But this right here is actually very, very turned. It doesn't look to be um, really following the same. I mean, it's the same idea as this with this very curved sort of thing but this makes sense with this shape this just looks like a juxtaposed almost like a mausoleum or something there's so it's kind of interesting it works though it doesn't stand out enough to be noticeable but it is it's a little bit of an anomaly in the in the drawing having that um square shape there a rectangle oh, let me use this. okay Peep this. I'm going to catch up with the chat. I can see it popping up. Kirby Toth, Frazetta, writes and Corbin. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I know that he loves Frazetta. I think that's probably one of the reasons that for me, and look, I, I don't consider Frazetta a pure comic book artist. That's why he's not in that top three group. But Frank is definitely one of my favorite artists of all times. But I think that that is part of why I like Mignola's stuff so much is, is the Frazetta influence in his work, although it's very put through Mike's filter. Um, yeah, no, he loves he loves Frazetta's work. He loves uh, Jeffrey Catherine Jones too. Right, I you know it's funny because Mike's stuff I've seen people do inking demos and and little like fan art pieces kind of off of his stuff. I always kind of like in the back of my mind I'm like oh, I don't think Mike's gonna like that, but it is what it is. I mean you put pencils up online, people are gonna want to ink them, and if you put black and white art, people are gonna want to color it. So, you know. It's just the way that the internet is. You've got to lighten up a little bit. And plus, you figure they're doing it out of a genuine fandom. I think where the, where the issue comes, and I've, I've actually seen this happen with the stuff that I've worked on, is, is you'll have some really kind of half-assed comic book reporting, and they'll just go on Google and find a piece of fan art and not realize that it's not something that you did because they're not even really looking for that. They're just like... I need a Mignola piece. It's like, okay, there's Hellboy, and it's like some fan-colored thing. And so that could be problematic, I think, for the, the professionals. But again, that's the quality of comic uh, reporting that you get out there. <laughs> Where would you start with Mignola? Um, hmm. This is what I would honestly recommend. I'm not going to tell you what I think you should start with, but what I would recommend is is, is we look at this stuff. Just if you see something that looks cool to you, then try to to seek out stuff that's more that era. Um, Mike's stuff has gotten more and more simple over the years. Um, and, you know, if you just Google Mignola art, you'll see more of a, probably a variety of it. But um, I, I don't know where I would recommend someone start with Mike. I mean, um, I, I think that, that, that uh, your instincts will kind of tell you more maybe this video is a good place to start you know honestly you're going to see a lot of different stuff from a lot of different um 
you know, time periods. Although I don't think I went back super far. I mean, it's it was just a folder I had. Um, this is nice. I don't know if I've ever seen this. You started with Hellboy. Yeah, I I started with Hellboy too. Um, Seed of Destruction was the first um, Mignola stuff that I I had seen, or Dark Horse Presents, so, somewhere around then. But I liked it immediately. You know, it was very different from all the image stuff that was coming out and, and just really fun. I've got a few um, for the person that asked um, about where to start with Mignola. Search Mignola on my channel because I've done other videos on Mike. And that might help you too. I really like, personally, I like, um, uh, I want to call it Lone Wolf. It's not Lone Wolf. Iron Wolf, I think, is very, very cool. I actually love the Fofford and the Grey Mauser stuff that he did. Um, I'm not as huge a fan of Cosmic Odyssey as, as I think some people are. Um, but, it, 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 you know, it honestly could be because it's, it's I, 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 I don't know, like the colors maybe don't really work for me. So this is a collab piece. So this is Mignola and uh, Matt Haley, I think is his name. I will say this. This is very, very interesting. Is This is an unusual pose for Mike to do for Hellboy, to be honest, especially on any kind of a cover image. It's very, very rare that you'll see him do not only like somewhat of a side or turn view, and this is kind of like a three-quarter view, um, but, but yeah, he's got Hellboy at a very, very interesting angle. So the collaboration spirit actually brought something out of him i don't know sometimes on collab pieces um one person will lay it out so it's possible it's an interesting piece this looks more like something you would see inside the book to be honest yeah well mike jokes about the way that he draws skulls um oh the aliens book is really good that's a good call too I actually love, like, if you look up Mignola, Marvel Comics Presents, he did a bunch of Marvel Comics Presents covers that are really, really cool. It's a very, very kick-ass era of his stuff. I'm trying to think, too. There's something else around that Aliens. It's called Alien Salvation, right? Um, there's something else that he did right around that time that's really, really good. The Dracula book is cool. It's not inked by him. It's inked by John Nyberg, I think. I could be wrong. Um shoot what was i gonna say oh his skulls he talked about i think he he ended up removing even more of the skull like like he's he keeps simplifying his skulls but there's a part of the skull that he doesn't draw is it the what is it? i have a mignola poster i think it's part of the jaw or something like he removes something do you remember what he said about that yeah the dracula book is pretty awesome yeah his storytelling is brilliant Okay, so here's a oh, and Batman. This is uh, Legends of the Dark Knight. I think fifty seven or fifty eight. Really, really good Batman story, and he kind of credits it as sort of being the first Hellboy style story that he did, where it's it's starting to take his already very graphic style into the horror. Um, you know what would you call it? Uh, Um, what do they call that? The liter, like the style of the literature that he pulls from, not suspense. It's like mystical and witchcraft and all that stuff. Yeah, it's a nice page. So this is this is a scan off the original. I don't know if I got this off of Heritage. It doesn't have a watermark, so I'm not 100 percent sure. I've said this before in other videos. So Aaron Weisenfeld and Richard Bennett both owned originals from this, and when I first met them. Um, and I think Richard Bennett's uh, office, he had the double page spread of Batman, like on the mausoleum up on his wall, like in a frame. And I think he had uh, maybe one or two other pages. And then Aaron at his house, they they lived in an apartment complex, but like an apartment away from each other. But Aaron had um, a page or two from it as well, if I remember correctly. It's been a while. A cult thriller. Right, right, right. Yeah, like a cult type stuff. But yeah, like this is great too. Man, I don't even remember this. What a spread. Holy shit. This thing is badass. This is what I'm talking about. So so um, imagine that you're a person that wants to learn to draw, but you want to draw comic books. How are you really going to prepare for this? It, it, it's like, I, I think that, that, that what you want to do is you want to come up with sort of an approach that you can do consistently. 
and and as as you can draw consistently, even if it's at a low level, you're still you're sharpening basically your storytelling skills, which is really what it's about. It's it's the idea that it's drawing. Yeah, it is drawing, but it's the same as like songwriting. Imagine being a musician and going like, I want to write songs like whatever the Beatles or Led Zeppelin, some band that's like super iconic, like like sitting and just woodshedding and like learning like you know harmonic minor scales isn't really writing songs you'd be better off spending three years writing kind of mediocre songs and getting better at the skill of writing the, the music you know the songs the hooks the the orchestration of things that's really what it's about so you know we all love a nice drawing it's great you know but this is this is putting it all together in a magical, mystical, beautiful page. And just to be clear, I am taking a break from YouTube for a few weeks. So it's just, just to finish Crystal Planet and get Blaster Kid launched. So I, I is as, as I move into the Blaster Kid launch, I mean, I'll definitely be back on YouTube. Um, but uh, I need to get Crystal Planet finished so I can get on Blaster Kid. It's just, it's I can't have that take any longer so um because it's just crystal planet ended up being a lot of work um because i had to design everything that took up you know almost a month to, to basically not even just drawing the pages but i mean like literally creating every single thing that's in the book it's all shit i made up nothing existed <laughs> so what i'm talking about that's why i knew i knew there was no way that i could have prepared for it because i you know you wouldn't you wouldn't know what you're going to draw if they say, oh, it's it's there's a trucker and this trucker turns into rocks, kind of like the thing, but different. And, and uh, you know, he he uh, eats asphalt. That's how he gets his power. That's is, is asphalt um, fuels him. He can't eat, you know, human food anymore. He gets nutrients from from actually other minerals like rocks and minerals. You know, how do you prepare for that? You just don't. This is cool. This is this is Hellboy. I was almost thinking it was something else. He's got a, he's done a lot of pages like this with the white background and then just the silhouetted figure. You know this kind of idea where it's like you know something standing here and then there's like a huge thing. But he'll keep all the black on kind of the um, central thing. Ah, oh, this is cool. I love stuff like this. He does the best buildings. They're so crookedy and kind of like like he always puts a nice perspective on them. But man, they're cool. So this says Rex Monday Monday number nineteen cover. Rex Monday sounds a little familiar. Ka ka ahoy there, folks. What is up, King Crow? Godspeed with your Blaster Kid productivity. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Would like to see. Yeah, I would love to see Mike do a Doctor Strange story. Acid asphalt. He could eat acid too. Maybe he eats acid and then he eats asphalt. And he's really, he never actually has turned into a hero, but in his drugged and fueled fever dreams, he thinks that he has. And that's why he's he, he eats acid and then asphalt. This is cool. I remember this piece. It's got like bird like talons, um, almost like fish like scales, and then a bull head, I guess. Is that a bull or like a goat i don't even know what that is ox it's almost got like a wolf muzzle and then oxen horns mike you're crazy oh man check out this he doesn't like drawing batman that's what he says i always find that interesting he's like the perfect guy to draw batman doesn't like batman <laughs> You gotta love Mike. His interviews are the best. This is I, I'll actually recommend this too. On YouTube, there's at least three quite long interviews with him. If you ever are feeling down in the dumps and insecure about your work or confused, watch any of those long interviews with him. It's probably one of the most reassuring things you'll ever hear because he talks about that he had no spine he had no confidence in his work he thought he was terrible he felt lost he was a shitty anchor and um he really really had no backup plan and he just stuck it out 
and became, to, in my opinion, probably one of the greatest comic book artists of the last, you know, 50 years. So he did it. Hope you get back to Blaster Kid soon, Rich. I picture your life becoming lost by not working on it. No, not necessarily. I'm not lost, not working on it. But, uh, I, you know, they knew they knew going into it. I was literally asked to do Crystal Planet like a week before I was going to launch Blaster Kid. But I had no work and I needed money. So I had to take something. I was either going to take an inking job or I could take a penciling job. So I went with a penciling job, obviously, because I wanted to get out of inking. But um, I just look at it as, look, the, the first year that you draw comics, it's just going to kick your ass. You know, they joke about that. Like you have a thousand shitty drawings in you or a thousand pages that you need to get out. I might as well just start working through all that process. You know what I mean? It's like even our favorite great, great artists, usually the first couple of years, you know, you're, you, you have some nice stuff, but, but uh, it's, you know, it gets better. So I'm at the front end of it all. But a blaster kid will definitely push different buttons for me. I mean, I think when I really start working on it, it it's going to be like uh, working on it where I'm seeing Kelsey coloring pages and sequentials are being shown to people and, and you see the excitement of it. I think that's going to really ramp things up a lot. But really, I swear to God, all I do now is just draw. Um, that's it. I, I wake up, I get coffee, I go for like an hour walk, and then I draw until literally I stop at the end of the night. You know, that's that's it. I'll wind down with a little guitar, but I'm not, you know, spending copious hours on it. This is cool. I actually like when he draws these big kind of guys like this. And he's got squids. I think those are squids. And Abe Sapien. This is a very arty cover. It's almost got a little bit of like a Dave McKean vibe. Dave McKean would would actually, it would be like in a box frame with like real flowers and, uh, you know, formaldehyde squids. <laughs> I guess crazy. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, that's wild. would be interesting to see like i would love to see mike do a series of short stories where where like um almost like mike takes on like you know what if mike drew akira what if mike drew um you know death dealer it would be really really fun like a big 150 page book of him doing short stories of all these different things yeah his interviews are are good and look well I always appreciate the people. It is Blaster Kid, one word. Some people break it up. You'll know later, though. When you see when you see the logo and stuff like that, it'll it'll help cement it. This is funny. From small, her her head it almost reminded me of um, Mark Twain or something. Like I was picturing like a little white, like the white, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> kind of goatee on him. It's a fancy hairdo. And this looks like a hairbrush or like like razor, like a silhouette of a razor. Maybe it's Mark Twain and he's shaved and Mike is symbolically showing us that. No, I don't think that's it. This is really, really cool. Man, I love the lighting on Hellboy here with that big sweeping shadow. He's got great, great shapes. The shield is badass and Hellboy just looks tough as nails right here. He looks like he's up for it. Really fascinating silhouette, right? Like, like the the shape of Hellboy, how he he's like literally like a looks like a yam or something. That's really funny. No shoulders. Oh, look at that. So, for anyone out there that's a colorist, is is work like this? Do you find it enjoyable to do, or is it almost too much freedom? I'd be curious of what you think when you see stuff like this. Is it like, oh man, the playground is mine? Or do you wish that there was even more cues? Yeah, if you just search Mignola and then put your settings to long, over 20 minutes, um, they, 
YouTube has two um, options for that, which is under four minutes or over 20 minutes. Just select the long interviews and you'll find them. Like I said, there's there's three. One is like the Society of Illustrators. One is in a comic book store. And there's another one um, that's quite long. And they're all excellent. And he kind of goes over the same thing, which is, is just how insecure he was and how um, much, how hard it was for him to learn. He really, really had to fight tooth and nail for his progress, from what he says. So this is from one of his sketchbooks, 2008 sketchbook, I believe. Yeah, and these are signed 2008. So these are just like little spot illustrations that he does just, you know, throughout the, the month, you know. Most of them, I'm mean, some maybe covers, but but I, I think a lot of them really are just uh, like little sort of fun pieces that you can do. I'm actually, this is funny, is one of the things I was going to do, and it wasn't necessarily inspired by this, is um, I am going to start doing um, lots of, of singular, quicker illustrations of Blaster Kid characters and Crystal Planet characters to get people familiar with the content. And I think it'll also probably encourage... Um, you know, fan art and stuff like that, and just create a familiarity with the, the stuff. So uh, I do intend to do that over the next few weeks, kind of get that rolling. So trying to ramp up my social media a little bit. I, I neglect it sometimes. I've really kind of put everything into YouTube. So that's, that's just where I focus. These are nice. A friend of mine, Carlos DeAnda, gave me one of these type of cards. These are about five... 5.5 by 8, I think, size little, um, kind of like on nice paper, thick, thick paper. It was a wrestling one with like a matador, not a matador, um, a luchador uh, mask. But these are cool. I've never seen these before. That's really, really cool. I would love to, like, man, if he released like a little pack of these, I would totally buy this. This is cool. I don't know. Is that a harpy? So this is 1998. That's a long time ago, man. Oh, this is cool. So this is Iron Man. This is from 2009? Or is this Iron Man? I think it's Iron Man. I wonder if this was published or if this was just for fun. That's pretty cool. That's interesting. I'm going to catch up with the chat. Yeah, I would absolutely love to see a Blaster Kid turned into a sideshow statue or something like that. In fact, I I feel pretty confident that at some point that would happen. I really do. I think Blaster Kid's going to do really, really well. Um, you know, the first campaign, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful for, but I can't, you know, I don't know what that's going to do. I think long term, Blaster Kid will be a rock solid uh, uh property for me you know what i mean i think that there, there's a lot of potential with the character i think that she's visually cool she doesn't look like everyone thinks i'll tell you that right now you guys are going to be in shock when you actually see what the character looks like i've done a little bit of a bait and switch with everyone but it's a good thing but she's i've talked to kelsey about it but uh yeah you'll see i had to have some tricks up my sleeve surprises it's kind of my thing i i I like to surprise people with, with what I create just because I think it's fun. You know, the mystery, the unsuredness. It's like, oh, man, I thought he was going to do this and he did this. You know, not to an annoying point, but uh, where it's fun, you know, with some anticipation because you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, this is cool. I actually really like when he does sketches like this. It's funny. Oh, the cliff guy. That's funny. I, uh, I, I'll, I'll leave that there. There was a guy that used to collect sketches of, he wanted characters on a cliff. Enough said. <laughs> um, this is interesting. I actually like too, that Mike does these little spot illustrations for books and stuff like that. It's, uh, um, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Right. Uh, I said I was doing one more art rich studio. Yeah, it was I know I, I said I said uh, on Sunday that I was going to do one more Kelsey and Rich live show, but Kelsey never I never talked to Kelsey throughout the week. I wrote him yesterday, never heard back, and and I just figured that 
I think these are different fan groups in a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Is like the people that follow the live shows might not necessarily be the people that watch all of my sort of regular content that I put up. So, uh, no, I this was completely planned. But I'm this is the last video that I'm doing until I'm finished with Crystal Planet. So, I'm a man of my word. If I commit to something, I do it, generally. <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm sure I've flopped on some things. I'm trying. It's all you can really do. These are cool. I always like this. This um, the cloak with the like kind of floating eyes. I think it's very very cool. Oh man, it's really nice. This I was gonna say. This looks like Kevin Nolan inks. I was right, and then I saw it. Yeah. So so Mignola and Kevin Nolan collaborated on a series of covers at one point. They're really really fantastic. I I think. For, for someone who adds a lot of like this fender feathering look and stuff like that, um, it actually works quite nice on Mike's stuff and gives it a little bit of a different hum that uh, the regular stuff doesn't have. So I think it's very, very cool. Are you still teaching on Patreon right now? I, I am going to be uploading like lesson videos. I'm not going to be taking private one-on-one -on -one lessons anymore for a few months. I'm going to try to continue to, the, to do the reviews for another month and see how that goes. But I just don't have enough time to do the hour lessons. But I'm going to do um, short lessons for everyone. So you'll get the, the educational itch scratched. Um, and then... I think I said this to someone yesterday that 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 part of learning and and taking lessons like direct lessons really comes down to that you need the feedback more than anything. A lot of learning really is just it's like a self it's a self discipline of working on stuff, but what you don't have when you work on your own, which a good teacher can do is give you a second set of eyes or ears is I take lessons from very, very good guitar players. Um, I hit a wall, you know, with guitar playing, and I need to be able to get to the next level. So it helps to have someone who's really, really good look at what I'm doing and go, like, well, this is what is going off course for you. So I think the idea of the hour lessons is appealing to people, but really the review is what you need. That's really what you, what you should be getting because... In the review, I'll tell you what you need to work on. Then you work on it, come back, get the review, and I'll go, well, your heads still look weird. You know, there's not enough structure. Libra Mayho and I talked about this in the video that Lee and I did, which was um, Lee and I, I think, both kind of go balls out when we draw. And Lee's at a very, very high level. He's years beyond where, where I'm at right now. But but there are other artists that came through Wildstorm that were more structure-based, meaning that, that they probably had a slightly more consistent look grounded in their work like Carlos Deanda really constructed a solid head whereas Lee and I kind of like looked at the finished product and went like that's looks cool I'm gonna learn that and the the when you learn that way sometimes your structure will fluctuate and eyes can be crooked or you know things size relationships don't match up consistently so a good amount of discipline, especially for drawing heads, I think is very important, is you really do want to be able to place things somewhat consistently. And it's funny, as artists will get sort of criticized criticized for that early in their careers, which is, oh, all their heads look the same. Like, all of the guys' heads look the same. To be quite honest, it's not a bad way to approach drawing heads at first, because it's a lot easier to draw one head and get really good at it, and then... Um, expand from there you know what i mean like once you've got a head down then you make the jaw a little bigger you make the cheekbones a little more defined you make the forehead bigger or smaller or you make the ears pop out more but if you have no structure or no sort of go-to version of it it's that's tough you gotta you have to have a kind of a go-to i'm still trying to remember what mike said he did to his skulls he removed something from his skulls. We'll see if I if I can see a good skull. Is it? It's part of the chin, I think. This guy's creepy. I remember him doing these. These were like sort of like old fashioned portraits, and then he would kind of amplify the creepiness by making them a little dead looking, and then putting weird objects around them. 
Nolan's is the only Hellboy I like more than Mike's. Yeah, I, I think I think he does a great one. Ah, this is cool. Look at this. Damn. I don't remember ever seeing this piece. This is really cool. I like how the chains are fading out here. Like in here, he's got them really kind of like sort of dissolving into the black. It's a real, real nice touch. Oh, Mike, you're so good. Was kind of neat. So he did the art of Mike Mignola, uh, or art of Hellboy, was like a new hardcover book he had at Comic-Con, not the past summer, because the COVID, there was no Comic-Con, but the year before. Um, and uh, I happened to go by his table before the show opened, and uh, I have the very, very first one that he ever signed for anyone. He told me that. He said, he goes, I've never signed this book for anyone before. So it's kind of neat. Um, and I was over there complimenting him and telling him how, how much his work meant to me and how much of a, an influence he's been on me really my whole career. Cause I would definitely say that my two favorite early comic books were Spawn and Hellboy. So all these years later, I, I think that, that those two books really had quite an impact on me. Reminds you of Poe. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah, I've never seen that one with the guy in chains either. He's always got little tricks up his sleeve. He's a, he's quite a prolific artist. So, oh, uh, these so these are the pieces I was talking about. The the watercolory pieces that he does. These are fantastic. It's really some of my favorite stuff that he does. I think these are beautiful. And he he um at one point he kind of went back on it. He was gonna take a year or two off to only paint, and he did a couple of paintings and seemed to abandon the idea. But uh. Even if he would do one of these type of pieces a month, I would be very, very happy because I think that these are just beautiful. I would love to own one of these. That's like a squad goal. Blaster Kid ever does really good. Someday I'll treat myself to one, just one. I just want one of these little watercolor pieces that he does. He handles it almost like oils. Like he really dilutes it and plays with the, um, the translucency and opacity of it. It's very, very cool can see the Kirby influence and it's for the king there you go bravo mr. Mignola I agree yeah so see do you see <laughs> look at the jaw here so he's he simplified his skulls so much that he actually has removed like part of the jaw like it doesn't have the um the masseter sort of wedge right here he's really like simplified it and look, I remember years ago, friends that were big, big Mignola fans kind of moaning and groaning about that they didn't like Mike's new stuff. It had gotten too simple and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, I personally think that that uh, two, there was two artists that particularly came to mind to me this morning when I was thinking about doing this video is I've been so impressed by what Arthur Adams has done throughout his career. And the fact that that guy can still bring it so hard is so inspirational because he's so freaking good still. And he's doing such high level shit. And Mignola is on his game, man. I, I think that, that whether you think that this is too simple or not, um, he still draws a lot and does a lot of very, very cool stuff. So, I'm 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 still a huge fan and always find it interesting to see new stuff that he's working on. These chains are great too. It's the way that he uh, juxtaposed them and then had them come over the um, the body of the fish snake thing, whatever they are, demons. This guy's cool looking, cool design. And this was the dude that, that was the first piece with the sort of the shackle around his neck. Oh yeah. We might be actually getting to the end of this. As this was another one of the early pieces when I was talking about Atlantis. Hot Lannis. No. <laughs> this is cool. I like this. Yeah, this is interesting. And that's a, it's a really, really interesting monster. It's, again, it kind of has that Kirby vibe, but put through the Mignola filter. It's super, super cool. Oh, he's so good. He's done so many Hellboy drawings. I I bet there's two or three thousand of just these spot illustrations. Oh, well, maybe not that many. He's done hundreds of these little sort of one-off um, side pieces, though. Let me catch up with the chat really quick. Yeah, M Mark Silvestri would do a great Hellboy 
has he ever even drawn Hellboy? He's had to have done at least like a headshot. I think I've seen a headshot that Mark did at a con of Hellboy. But dude, Mark could draw anything and I would be happy. You know what? I, I'll say this. I think if I had a top five comic book artist, it would be... It seems like right now, J. Scott Campbell is definitely on my mind a lot. I'm going to go Mignola, Travis, Mark Silvestri... I always put Frank Miller in it. I think I, I maybe a Tomo and Mobius. There you go. <laughs> Does that count? Is that that's a good top five, right? Mignola, Mobius, Atomo, Travis, Silvestri. That's who I love. Campbell gets an honorable mention because I've I've got Campbell on the mind a lot. Oh, this is so good. Look at this. Holy shit. This is what I'm talking about. Can you imagine owning one of these? Whoo! People who say he doesn't draw good shit now. Look at this. Come on. These are very, very unforgiving pieces. Man, you go too dark on your application of this watercolor or water diluted ink and color and stuff he's putting down, you're going to have a value nightmare on your hands. Because you see, he pulls it very, very dark over here and then just gradually fades it. That is beautiful, man. Oh, my God. This is so good. I love how fun th just these these shapes in the background are, too. They're great. Fuck, man. I would love a piece like this. This is so good. No eyes. No eyes on any of these characters. I mean, obviously, they're, they're supposed to be super creepy, especially the ones in the back. But even this guy. You know, it's interesting, too, is, is this guy clearly is human still because he's got the flesh-colored skin. But this would have been the one character that I might have considered, actually, you know, like, like that he's still got some life in him and giving him pupils. Not saying that it needs it, but if the thought might have crossed my mind on it. I'm so bad at Photoshop now. I've been in Clip Studio so much lately. I can't remember how to my shortcut keys in Photoshop are starting to get weak. Okay, so this is the piece I was talking about. So this was one of those little mini prints, and I have it. It's on kind of like a cardstock, fancy paper in color. Um, but yeah, the Luchador pieces that he did. Hellboy Darkness crossover half. Oh yeah, God, well, that would be so good. He's surgical with his watercolors. Yeah, I agree too. It's like an old photograph. Oh, Capullo. No, no, I actually I love Capullo's stuff, but he wouldn't be in my top five. No. Top twenty, probably. But yeah. No, I did I did Capullo. I think Capullo is a badass. Um, but uh yeah, he I don't think he would make my top five right now. Who knows? Talk to me a week from now. Maybe I'll be like Capullo's number one. This is cool. I remember when Capullo, when he first got on Spawn, and I was like, who is this guy? This is a McFarlane. And then he got better and better. <laughs> and at one point, I think m most Spawn fans would agree that he was kind of drawing it better than Todd did. Um, I know that's blasphemy, but dude, Greg got really good on Spawn. I mean, like, st stupid good. He was killing it. But without Todd, you know, it wouldn't have been possible. I remember this piece in color. I think I, I have this comic, for sure. Get Mignola to do a blaster kit as a bonus tier. <laughs> dude, oh my god. That would be insane. Yeah, right? Oh, man. It's yeah, Hellboy Darkness crossover by Mark and Mike. Man, I would settle for a Mark Silvestri Hellboy short story, you know, or just his Batman comic. Get the Batman comic out. Lee Bermejo says the first issue is done. He said he saw it, so hopefully that comes out this year. DC needs to do us right and give us the gift of Silvestri. I think their fear is if it's three books and Mark doesn't have issue two done, that two and three may never come out. I mean, I'm speculating, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that's generally why stuff like that doesn't come out is they want to make sure that they've, they're going to be able to, like, fulfill it. Although, at some point, enough years go by. Oh, see, this is another one of these. 
Cthulhu. Man, that's really good. He does the best cottages and little villages. Man, they're so kick ass. Oh, Todd. Todd says the quote. Cool. Yeah, Todd's funny. He does say that he's like he's like I'm not a good artist. He's like I'm he's like I'm good at making it exciting, which I which uh, I I think that Todd actually is a really really good penciler. But yeah, <clears throat> you know, Jim Lee had more refined drawing chops. Silvestri is kind of like a freak of nature. Wills has kind of got that too. Wills Wilson and Silvestri had a lot of natural ability. So when they got good, they were real good. That's kind of the difference. That's where natural ability sometimes can edge you up a little bit. Anyone I personally believe can learn to get good at something like drawing if you really commit to it. I honestly believe that. And I think that in the long game, if you're super committed and work hard, you could probably get better than someone with natural ability. But if someone with natural ability applies themselves, they're going to smoke you because it's they're going to get really good and they're going to have just these natural x factors they're very very difficult to learn um, but it's more of an aesthetic it's art is subjective so better doesn't really actually exist but but there'll be a little bit of a magic to some people's stuff it's tough to put a finger on what it is it's just all these subtle things usually it's a level of dynamics like like Capullo has that there's there's he's got a gift of of energy and really quite good with moving form around in space so his stuff is appealing just based on that when he got real good on spawn there's some stuff some Sam and twitch shit that he did that like I was like man these drawings are high level shit this is nice Capullo could do a great Hellboy comic. I, you know, and, and this is another thing about Capullo. I'll tell you what, he he's got some color pieces or used to the color pieces that he did on Deviant Art, where he kind of does like digital painting, but like Frazetta sort of inspired. Those are great pieces. That's like an untapped thing that he does that is so freaking good it's really a shame that there's only like a small handful of them he did he did like a western spawn cover or whatever that character is called in it there's like a wizard and like sort of like a weird cobbled room with like a cauldron and stuff there's i think there's four they're really really good go to his deviant right now and you need to look at those Uh, well, Jackson, I mean, um, with, with Mark, Mark, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Mark has got a pretty decent sized body of work and, and the, the, I think the one unfortunate thing with Mark is, is just over the last 20 years, he hasn't done a lot of like full books that he's done a hundred percent on his own. I think when you see this new Batman book, if it's all Mark, you'll understand more why he's so good. But yeah, he he really kind of embraced being a company owner or running a company. And I think that that, that sort of uh, distracted him from, from drawing as much. I think drawing was just something that he could naturally do really, really good. I think even Finch would tell you that Mark is a badass. I know he would. <laughs> I'm telling you, I want to have Finch on and do a video where we look at Mark's stuff. And I want to, I want, oh God, I love this piece. Um, I want to have Finch um, share stories about Mark. And, and I would love to ask him about Mark because I don't, Mark never talks about drawing. It drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. <laughs> the KFAP guys right now are contacting him. <laughs> is cool yeah this is the baltimore cover i love this piece oh my god it's so badass okay let me catch up with the chair okay yeah yeah yes to everything that you guys have texted or or posted in the chat all right 
And Jackson, it was funny, is is some of the talk that I was talking about about um, studying Mignola was actually referring to some of your lessons. In fact, it was it's a few people. I've got a few people that uh, have taken direct lessons from me that are Mignola fans. But uh, I was thinking of you, the the relegating of levels of detail based on the size of the objects that he draws. You know, I think y you can think of it as that he draws everything simple, but he he still will allocate the level of detail based on. Um, how far something sits in the scene or how big or small it is the proximity he'll use um like diffusion you know and just start dropping out lines and stuff as things go back this is cool well this ended up being a really funny fun video i was i was a little sort of apprehensive about doing it because it's always sort of weird to do like a live stream solo um, but uh, it's worked out nice. I'm, I feel like I've put some good things in my head looking at Mignola today. So thank you all for joining me on the journey, and uh, hopefully it was fun. And look, anytime I give opinions on stuff, just remember it's one person's opinion. If you don't agree with what I say, then just in your mind go, fuck you. <laughs> I don't mind. It's like I watch these videos back, and sometimes I say shit, and I go, eh, I don't even really... I don't know. What was I thinking? This is cool. I love that skull. So take it with a grain of salt because it's just, it is what it is, babies. <laughs> Life rolls on. I actually follow a guy named Life Rolls On on Instagram, and he draws with his mouth. He's, I think he's a paraplegic. He's a pretty good artist too, to be honest. Uh, there's two. There's two artists that I follow that are that draw with their mouse. One is called the Mouth Artist, I think, and the other one is Life Rolls On. I would I've plugged their um, channels before or Instagrams. This is creepy. What's funny is so when I looked in this folder, it was all Mignola except for five photographs that had somehow got saved in the same folder, and they were all Egyptian sarcophaguses. So it's funny that. Uh, this kind of reminds me of some of the, the stuff that was in there. But I don't know where I found it. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thank you guys for showing up. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and I think that, that Mignola's art is really a testament to being creative with, like, how you're going to approach your art. Because really, I mean, when Mike did this, I mean, I know that, that we can always come up with someone. You can go, well, this person sort of drew like Mignola before Mignola. But in American comics, generally speaking, there wasn't a lot of artists that worked in this sort of look. And so believe in what you do and go check out one of those Mignola interviews and, and realize that, that, look, you just all you need to do is get really, really good at what you do, what your ideas are, what your favorite things are, and inject them into your work, and then go for it and get really, really good at what you do. And, and you'll be your own artist. People will like your stuff more because you draw uniquely in your way. And look, they'll go, oh, like I see a little bit of Bernie Wrightson in your stuff, or I see a little bit of, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, from Mignola, we, we listed things that inspired him or influenced him. But, uh, you know, ultimately, you want people to look at your art and know it's yours. <laughs> this is interesting. So this is uh, digitally colored, but it, it is one of his washier pieces. So he would sometimes, I'll put this in grayscale so you can see. Um, but the, the problem is, is that some of the gray is, uh, I'll, I'll try to remove some of the gray. So this is probably closer to what the original looked like, except this would be white too. But you can see he used ink wash on this piece and then it's a traditional pen and ink piece, but this is just color that's still gray. But if I remove this, it'll start to remove uh, more of the wash, but you can get a little bit of an idea of what that looked like in black and white. So that's the only mashup that I've seen of the two sort of looks so far. He doesn't, I mean, he his blacks are always kind of washy. If you, they, they blew it, honestly, and I've and a few people have told uh, IDW this, but the first Hellboy um, artist edition, they leveled the scans or, or when they were provided the scans from Mike, um, they were leveled to be pure black in the black areas, which is not what Mike's stuff looks like, really. So the second, the amazing screw on head looks a little more true to like what his originals look like. It was disappointing to me, to be honest. 
I don't like to see the the jet black blacks on Mike stuff. I like the washy black ink that he uses. And I think that when you see his originals in person or a good scan of one, they're infinitely more interesting. Here we go. Perfect example. Thank you, gods of the internet, for providing me a perfect example. This is what I want to see when I see a Mike Mignola drawing. I want to see the blue pencil. I want to see these beautiful washy grays. Um, and and it's just it's like a watercolor ink painting and it's fucking gorgeous <laughs> earmuffs if you're sensitive but but this is what i'm talking about but if you look at the first um artist edition of mike stuff um i mean it looks like this everything is like jet black and uh it's just unfortunate because it's really not what a mike manuela original looks like but you know Look, when when the stuff was originally scanned, it probably wasn't scanned for an artist edition, and anything could have happened. Someone might have thought that they were doing a favor, but um, anyway, that's just my two cents. This is cool. Yeah, you want to see the brush strokes, right? I can agree with that idea about the washes. Definitely shows the artist hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these pieces look cool. Like they look cool with the jet black ink. It's still a very, very nice and interesting drawing. It just has a different hum. That's what I call it—the hum. There should be a warm quality to art. A little bit of a, a little bit of a pulse. You know what I mean? This is all art, arty, farty talk. But I, I think that there's something to it, you know? Maybe that's one of the X factors, you know, honestly. I And look, and it's a huge problem with actual digital inking, I'll tell you that right now, is the, the, the biggest problem with people that use Clip Studio Paint is the work looks flat a lot of times. And I know artists are trying to work around that by using splatter brushes and all these different things. But there's just a little bit of a different vibe and a little bit of an inconsistency that ink on paper provides that when you paint by it in jet black it doesn't have it and it starts to really flatten things out and you you wouldn't think that there would be that big of a difference but it's an it's a little bit of an anemic line and it also is the problem is is that even panel borders end up being pixel perfect there's no like ink pen that sort of beads on the corner or the texture of the paper sort of making the line um you know have a little bit of a fluctuation all of that kind of adds character to the art um, but there are ways around it um you know you can use like the real g pen has a little bit of like sort of a tooth to it you can you can go in and actually mess around the parameters of the tools and whatnot but yeah i remember uh jason pearson uh started to fill in his blacks years ago um digitally and it really changed the look of his work and Ultimately, those same exact spots would have been filled in with a paintbrush and India ink. And you go, well, what would be the difference? I'm telling you, there was a visual difference in the art when it was filled in digitally than it was when it was done traditionally. So you just want to be mindful of it. You can There are workarounds. You just need to make it have a little bit of sort of um, inconsistencies, honestly. Watercolor brush might work. Okay. I'm just catching up with the chat. I like the word warmth. Yeah, so so this is another word that I use is smoky, like a smoky quality. I remember when I was inking Travis, we did, um, uh, was during issue two when Voodoo, Voodoo shows up. And um, her eyes, there was always this kind of smoky quality, like around her eyes. And uh, if you inked it really like linear, linearly, meaning like if I just put lines down, it tended to look a little flat and a little anemic. And so Travis would sometimes go in and hit things with wash because he was still, his mind was still X-Men Wildcats, I think. Um, but but uh, you could get the look by just kind of feathering your 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 uh, pen line a little bit more. So, but I was always kind of going for like a dusky, smoky look around the eyes. So $800 for this little drawing. Don't you wish that everything you drew there was this level of detail was 800 bucks. You could do two or three of these a day and be making a good living. <laughs> Although you wouldn't want to oversaturate your market. This is cool. Nice windmill. And, and you know, look, this is, this is a good example of like adding some character to the lines. Like these are very, very interesting windmill arms. I don't know what they call those, these things. 
but do you see how they're they're very kind of the the fluctuate and it doesn't look like a 3d model that just has been like traced everything in mike's wolf has a little bit of a lean a little bit of a bend a little bit of a curve oh yeah this is cool this is third wish right this is nice and you can see here like i mean these are fairly fairly black blacks on this compared to some of the stuff that he did but there's still just a little little bit of opacity or translucency excuse me um, to two of them and again i mean he uses blue pencil you can see it in the drawing it's very very interesting it's it's pretty crazy Got to run, folks. Yeah, no problem, Billy. Thank you for coming by. And, you know, this video will be up. I don't ever delete these things or anything like that. So um, thank you for popping in. And, and uh, yeah, so this was 500 originally when it sold. It's a nice little piece. Creepy Dracula guy. And this is from the ball. I think we're at the end. We'll see. Oh, no. Fin Fan Foom. Fin Fang Foom. It's cool. It's a nice drawing. Let's do it in black and white. Right, watch this. This will uh, can remove the color on this easy. I can tell by looking at it there. It's still got a little bit of gray. Let's take it out one more time. Yeah, sometimes the digit, like the flatter digital coloring, you can actually remove it pretty easy. So what I did is I just I went Control Levels or Control L. There's a shortcut key, and then when you hit Control L, you'll see this pop up. I grab the far right eyedropper, and what I'm doing. Oh, hold on, I've got to have it grayscale. Sorry. Um, once it's grayscale, I go control L, I hit the far right eyedropper, whatever you touch, it's going to turn white and then a certain amount of proximity of value around it. So like if I hit black, it's going to completely obliterate the thing. Um, but it's like a pixel sample. Um, but, uh, yeah, if, if, uh, you just hit the light grays, you can kind of remove it and get a little bit of an idea of what the black and white, it's a fun little trick I figured out. Not groundbreaking or earth shattering but uh yeah, i think it's cool okay so this is a farford and the gray mauser page this is the stuff that i personally really like in an era of his stuff that i like it's a little more kind of p craig russell-ish that's another influence that he had too by the way we didn't mention p craig russell he's definitely influenced by p craig russell there's no doubt in my mind some of his more um uh, what would you call it like a uh, flourishy lines he, he used to have a little bit more of a curve to some of his stuff. But I would say P. Craig Russell and Jack Kirby and Frazetta were, were early influences. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, well, and, you know, look, as I learn more about drawing and go through these experiences, although, like, I even I realize that, that I'm seeing it from a beginner's point of view in many ways. Um, but uh, I'm trying to share the observations that I make along the way. I've been around comics long enough to, to understand sort of the learning process and what to expect in terms of like how long it takes to get better at stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, as, as I'm picking up little things about penciling, I'm trying to share them with people so that I can shorten the amount of time that it takes for you to get better at it. Because for me, I just hit my head against the wall a million times. But ultimately, it just came down to um, fundamentals, to be quite honest. It was like I was trying to work from the top down, and I needed to work from the structure up. <laughs> it's like, you can't build a house by just admiring the painting. <laughs> There's rooms and plumbing and all this stuff that needs to plumb. So this is great, man. This is a beautiful, beautiful Dracula page. I I know that that like I had said before, Mignola didn't ink this. It's John Nyberg. I'm I'm nearly sure. Nyberg did a nice job though. You know, it's got a little tiny bit of like the Mignola flavor to me, but then also maybe a little of the Kevin Nolan. But it's really, really good. He did a real, real nice job. It's Manuel is not easy to ink because it's like you go too far. It looks goofy. Let's look at this one, black and white. Okay, I'll do it one more time. It's a fun piece. It's got a little blown out, but you can kind of get a better idea of it. It's like Scotty Young meets Manuela. <laughs>
Okay, I'm going to wrap it up because I really do need to get to work. But uh, I didn't want to leave everyone hanging home. Well, let's see. Let's, let's look for some more black and white art real quick. Um, but yeah, I wanted to make sure to at least have a send off, um, live stream, but I'll be back. Like I said, I'm only going offline for one particular reason. That's to get crystal planet done so I can get on blaster kids. So, um, I'm not like annoyed with the internet or, or, you know, getting offline for any other reason that I'm just busy. So gotta be focused. And also, you know, I, I, I've shot a lot of videos that I haven't uploaded, but, but uh, I said this in a recent video is, is one of the sort of things that I've always tried to do for a long time is finish jobs stronger than I start. What I mean by that is like the hardest part of doing a piece of art in general is finishing strong. It's one thing to go into a piece enthusiastic. It's another to work real hard for four or five hours on th something. But if you lose focus or get hacky in the last quarter, ultimately your pieces just kind of turn out okay. I mean, they could turn out really nice, but I mean, they're not going to be as great as they would. And so for, for me, I've learned so much doing as much as I've done right now. And I feel like that if I really push myself hard, I could maybe get a little bit more out of myself for the last like 10 pages of this first issue. So I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to dig in and, and, you know, fight it out and, and move forward, you know? And, uh, I, like I said, I've been around a lot of different artists and I've seen what works and the, one of the real bad habits that, that you can have is to get impatient and try to rush things out, especially at the end of a piece or a project. Um, you know, so try to finish stronger than you started, you know, you want to hit the gas pedal and kind of like accelerate as you move along. And I mean, accelerate towards quality, not, uh, getting it done. <laughs> it's easier said than done, but I, it is something that, that even when I would ink, you know, I would really dig in. And in fact, a, a good example I can say is when I worked with David Finch, um, I would really, really work hard on the most boring, mundane pages that we would sometimes have to do. And that's not a slight to David, but what I mean is sometimes when you draw a comic book, there are pages that just aren't as exciting as Batman punching someone. And we always worked really hard on those pages. And in fact, I could tell that David really kind of dug in on those too. But I think some of the nicest inks sometimes that, that that I would do on David were on those pages that that would be kind of forgotten you know in an original art pile they would be ones that people would would skip over but you know it is what it is they're all important every single page that you draw is important and uh, you want to have a body of work that's a, a if it was a batting average you know you want to be batting like 700 it's a lot higher than what pro baseball players do but i think that like to be an artist that people are going to remember you need a pretty you need to be batting at least 600 more than half of your shit should be pretty epic and then you'll do okay <laughs> you have to work up to it so just you know this is this is the long plan for all of you right now if you're if you're struggling which which i know that some of like my students and patrons are you just gotta you gotta just put on them put in the miles first. That's that's step one is get those first like three years of learning and, and growth pains out of the way. And then you'll be flying. And then it's it's what you do with it, you know. So you'll have a level of familiarity and, and uh, enough experience that, that you know it's not like you're trying to find your way through pieces. It's it's what are you going to do with all the ideas and tools that you have? So I, I think that's a good way. Let me see. What is it? Finch is really, really typical and boring. Like he has no soul in his art as well as Jim Lee, but he has better storytelling. So wait, uh, wait, Finch is really, really typical and boring. Like he has no soul in his art as well as Jim Lee. So Jim and Finch both, are typical and boring, but Finch has better storytelling. All right, so this is the end. This is convention sketchbook number one. 
I'm, I'm like trying to think if I have this one. I have a lot of Manila sketchbooks. I'm not 100% sure if I have sketchbook number one. That'll that'll be a vacancy in my my heart, my collector's heart, the the OCD. <laughs> um, so uh, it was just the only reason I reread your post. It's it's Dustin. You can say whatever you want. I don't care. I just I when I read it, I was trying to make sure that I just understood what it was. So I wasn't trying to um, you know, put a hyper spotlight on. It. I was just trying to make sure that I understood what what uh, you had said. So let me get back into this. All right. My camera drifted. Yeah, so, okay, I should be back in, um, uh, I think, three weeks. So it's January 20th. I'm, I'll try to get back by the 10th of February. Um, and if, if I'm done sooner, I'll come back quicker. Um, but, uh, yeah, so anyway, like, again, thank you all for tuning in. I think that a lot of people will probably watch this video, like, later. So um, either way, I appreciate you tuning in. Oh, and you know what? This is, if you could do me a small favor, if you're not subscribed to my channel, I'm just about to crack 18,000 subs. So if you haven't subscribed, please do. And, uh, oh, no worries. You can rewatch it. You're here now. Hello, Herax. Um Thank you, Richard, and take proper breaks from working. You know, hey, what's up, Antoine? How are you? Nice to see you. Um, uh, what I was going to say is, um, yeah, no, look, this is, I'll, I'll tell you the honest to God truth. I've worked around people, and I won't say their names. They really, really grind hard, and I work really, really hard, but I've always made sure that, that I leave something in the tank for the next day. It's incredibly important to do because I would rather be able to draw for 50 years than to burn myself out or to injure myself. So, you know, doing a 23 hour day or working two days straight, I don't think is good for you. I personally think that, um, you know, you be you would be better off drawing for nine hours, seven days a week and even splitting it up. Yeah, my cat is, I, I have two cats and two guitars. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna wake you up. Um, but uh, <laughs> oh, you're in a Zoom class, that's awesome. I work hard too. It's the Viagra. <laughs> nice. No, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, like, um, you don't want to, you don't want to overextend yourself where like, what's the point of working for like 20 hours one day, if then you're burned out for two or three days. And I've seen artists work that way where they get, they procrastinate. Jim is the only person that I've ever seen that actually flourishes in that insane, um, sort of scenario. Jim likes to take things into the red and then he just goes and it and it seems to work for him uh, it's too stressful for me i i would rather like right now it's noon here where i live i'll i'll draw until like seven or eight o'clock tonight around eight eight thirty i'll stop i'll study for maybe an hour and hit the sack and then i'm uh, normally i would start earlier so i would already have a couple hours working but um uh look and here's here's the deal king crow just it's like i like i in general, I'm completely tolerant of people voicing their opinion, regardless if I agree with it or not, or if it's a controversial stance. As long as someone isn't making a personal attack on someone, it's just an artistic opinion. So I'm not going to get worked up about it. I have to... I've been online for a long time. In fact, it's perfect that Antoine's here because Antoine has known me for pretty much the whole time I've been online. I think that he and I probably met in 2002 or 2005 so a long time ago look everybody's gonna have different opinions on stuff i don't there's there's so much division right now in in comics that 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 i have to just stay true to how i've always behaved online and um oh thank you thank you um he likes to open that book series it kind of turned into super fun sunday it's basically the same thing but uh yeah you know it, it's like I'm not going to police someone saying that they don't like a particular artist because I teeter on that at times too. And there's stuff that I don't like, or I've never followed and it could seem insulting to someone, you know, especially if it's another pro where you're like, oh, I've never looked at their work. I mean, that sounds pretty shitty, but there's like, uh, you know, there's only so much time in the day. I only have so many comic books and, and um, well, like I said, I'm not going to get in a fight with someone over, over, you know, a, a, artistic opinion it's just it's 
It, this is I watched uh, when when Wildstorm first had the message boards. I would watch artists uh, argue with fans. It doesn't go well. It's there's there's no real there's no real win in it. So it's like whatever, you know. Trust me, you want to see nastiness. You go on the guitar forums. <laughs> Go go to some of the big guitar YouTube channels and see what they do. They kill each other. So, all right, you guys all have a great day. Go out there and kick some ass on your art, and then hopefully you'll get good enough where people will say that you suck. All right, later. Smash that like, and if you haven't subscribed, do it. If you have multiple YouTube accounts, subscribe. I just want to crack 18,000 today. Come on. You guys can get me there. Yeah. All right, have a good day. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Kelsey, wherever you are, take off that fake beard. <laughs> Bye.